Okay, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 16th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided to members in a digital format, some of us may be using tablets um, to review our papers. Uh, uh, we've got one apology uh, today uh, from, it says here, no apology has been received, but we have had an apology. Monica Lennon, unfortunately, can't make it uh, this morning, and we move to agenda item one, which is decision on taking business in private. Uh, the committee will agree whether to take item Seven consideration of its annual report in private. Are we agreed to that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Agenda item two is progress with housing supply and the joint housing delivery plan for Scotland 2015 to 2020. The committee will take evidence from Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing, and Andrew Mott, Head of Housing Market Strategy and North Programmes More Homes Division, and William Fleming, Head Housing Services Policy Unit, Scottish Government. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming along this morning. Uh, and uh, can I ask the Minister to, to make some opening remarks? Uh, good morning, convener, and thank you for the opportunity to come to the committee today uh, to update you on progress and inform you the future work plan on housing matters. Uh, I hope that you have found the papers that were circulated in advance useful uh, and that they might help frame our discussion. Uh, paper 1 explains how the Joint Housing Policy and Delivery Group is approaching delivery of the Joint Housing Delivery Plan, uh, which was published in 2015. Uh, this paper explains how the GP GHPDG uh, has evolved in its pro approach over time, uh, but also how the outcomes identified in the plan continue to be important in shaping its work. It also includes a forward look for future plenary group meetings. Uh, when I first met the GHPDG uh, in November 2016, uh, I encouraged them to be positive and practical. Uh, they have taken up that challenge, uh, and this has been reflected through discussions ranging from infrastructure to homelessness, increasing housing supply to welfare reform, and disabled people's housing to value for money. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to note my appreciation for all the hard work and commitment from members of the GHPDG, uh, especially Tom Barclay, our external co-chair. I and my ministerial colleagues value their contribution uh, to helping us achieve our ambition for everyone in Scotland to have access to a good quality, warm and affordable home. Uh, paper 2 picks out some uh, key milestones we've already met in 2018 and also sets out what we anticipate for the rest of 2018 uh, and looking further ahead into 2019. I'm pleased with the progress that the government is making uh, and members will be pleased to hear that I'm now going to, I'm not uh, going to read you out uh, a long list of our achievements right now. Uh, but I'm not complacent either, it has to be said, convener. Uh, Scotland's housing system faces a number of challenges, uh, including an ageing population, uh, the UK government's welfare reforms, uh, and approach to Brexit. Um, delivering our ambitions to tackle homelessness and child poverty are also issues that we have to face, as is making sure our fire, fire safety and building standards are always fit for purpose. And, of course, mitigating the impact of and adapting to the effects of cl climate change are also uh, very much in our agenda. Uh, we're already working hard to respond to these challenges, uh, but success will require everyone to play their part. Uh, convener, I hope that this is helpful context as the, you consider the committee's future work plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. It certainly is, and I, I know members will, will want to, to look at matters such as the types of houses that have been built, where they've been built, the affordability of those houses, and we'll come to all of that. But we can maybe start off just with the, the numbers of houses that have been built. That might be a reasonable uh, st starting point. Now, the commitment is uh, 50,000 affordable houses and a £3 billion investment over the lifetime of this parliament. Can I ask what the progress is in relation to that, Minister? Um, convener, um, you are right to point out uh, that we are uh, intent on delivering 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 for social rent over the course of this parliament, uh, backed by um, £3 billion uh, of investment over the piece. Um, as it stands at this moment uh, in time, uh, we are driving forward uh, with that programme. Um, we have ensured 
um, that all local authorities have uh, re resource planning assumptions for the next three years to give them the comfort uh, to move forward and over £756 million pounds is being made available this year for the affordable housing uh, programme. Um, we are not uh, expecting um, uh, that 50,000 to be split into 10,000 a year as we have said previously. Um, we are in a situation uh, whereby we know that there will be incremental growth uh, over uh, the piece. Um, st st uh, statistics published on the 13th of Mark, March showed uh, that in the first seven quarters uh, of the programme, uh, that's uh, to December 2017, 11,758 homes had been delivered, equating to almost a quarter, 24% uh, of the total homes required. Uh, that breaks down to 6,800. 874 social completions, 1,464 affordable rent, uh, mid-market rent, uh, and 3,420 low-cost home ownership. Um, whilst I'm not complacent, um, I think that that uh, bill will allow us the strong found foundations to build on um, and to achieve uh, the 50,000 affordable homes target, convener. Okay, that's helpful. I know members want to kind of look at those figures a little bit more, but the kind of figures I would like to, to look at is, yeah, there, there is a lot of money been put in and it's, it's all really welcome. So if, if I've got my numbers right, in this financial year, it's 568 million pounds going to local authorities. In 2019, 20, it's, it's 591. And in 2020, 21, it's, it's 630 million. I mean, these are fantastic figures. Apologies for now focusing on the uncertainty because these are good figures that will drive towards that 50,000 target. But uh, my local authority, for example, would, would really welcome these figures. They're enjoying spending the money in partnership with, local, with uh, their housing associations and planning ahead. But those three years uh, budgeting, these three years resource assumptions they're getting are fantastic for planning ahead. What happens after 2020, 2021? Because local authorities and housing associations are building up capacity. They're building up headcount in the system. Um, what happens? What certainty can you give uh, beyond 2020-2021? Uh, well, you're right, uh, Convener, to point out that this year £591 million uh, will be going directly to local authorities. Um, the programme itself uh, is £756 million. Next year, as you have said, £630 million, um, uh, and that will uh, rise. Um, that's £1.79 billion pounds over the piece uh, of those uh, planning assumptions and I have to say that um, it's quite unusual um, for us to be in the position to give you uh, give uh, comfort in terms of three-year budgeting. Uh, in terms of beyond 2021 um, the cabinet secretary at a recent um, conference uh, stated that we will talk to um, uh, partners uh, across the board um, and from that CIH uh, conference, um, uh, she uh, reiterated the point uh, that we will continue to speak to stakeholders as we develop our plans uh, beyond 2021. Um, work uh, will begin on all of that um, later on uh, this year. Um, so we hope to be in a, a position uh, with uh, the input of stakeholders uh, to say um, sometime, uh, maybe uh, next year, tail end of next year, exactly what our plans are for beyond 2021. But the key thing in all of this, convener, is gathering up um, the views um, of stakeholders and partners, um, as the Cabinet Secretary uh, pointed out at that CH CIH conference. Okay, that's helpful. Final question from myself, and then Mr. Whiteman to explore some more of this, this, this further. Uh, I see from my notes that if you look at the affordable supply outturn report 2016-2017, that 14 local authorities spent more than their, their RPA budgets, 14 spent less, and I've got a note here saying four spent roughly uh, the same. Now, I'm just wondering, is that just slippage in projects, or do we have to look again at what a local authority is getting how much money? Um, convener, um, the government has made it quite plain. I've made it quite clear, as is the First Minister, 
um, that if local authorities are unable uh, to spend up to their resource planning assumption figure, um, then we will move that money to areas that can spend that money. Um, now, I would hope that all local authorities would put in place um, plans to ensure that they can spend the amount of money that has been allocated to them. Um, I recognise uh, that for some places um, it has been difficult um, to reach the point uh, of building up the capacity um, to deliver. Um, I hope um, that that will continue um, to improve. Um, I recognise that in some areas um, there's a little bit more difficulty in terms of some aspects of delivery. Um, and I've also said to local authorities uh, that they should build slippage into their programmes um, in, in case they are one of the authorities um, that ends up getting more money because uh, there has been uh, the inability to spend um, elsewhere. Um, we will continue to monitor all of this. Um, I know um, from the many discussions um, that I have had with uh, housing conveners um, that they want to ensure that their local authorities do the very best that they possibly can. Um, but, you know, we will monitor all of this. Um, that situation, I think, it would be fair to say, is improving. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And invite me to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Just on this point <clears throat> of the 50,000 target, um, in the Shelter's uh, recent um, report on review of the strategic investment plans for affordable housing, uh, their analysis um, suggests that 96% of dwellings uh, may be new build, a further 2% may be acquisitions of one form or another, and 2% may involve refurbishment. On the stats from April 2016 to end of December 2017, 62% are, are new builds and 31% are off the shelf. So 62% new build at the moment, shelter suggesting 96% will be. What's your view on how many of the 50,000 will actually be newly built properties, given that the SNP manifesto said you were going to build at least 50,000? Um, the SNP manifesto said that we would deliver 50,000 um, uh, affordable homes, if I remember rightly, convener. Um, local authorities um, themselves have got to make decisions around about what's best um, for their area. Um, I um, uh, am very pleased that there are many new houses being built, um, but I also recognise um, that in some places it would be advantageous for the local authorities uh, to buy off the shelf or to buy back properties. Um, and if they see that as being the right thing to do, um, then I think it's, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the thing that the knowledge that they have based to, to know exactly what's required. Um, having uh, appeared in front of the committee before, I think, if I remember rightly, it was uh, you, convener, that questioned me about lo giving local authorities the flexibility um, to buy back, and we have that flexibility um, in place. Um, I uh, am pleased that the shelter um, uh, CIH uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, report um, because uh, it shows that we're on track um, to deliver uh, on the 50,000 target. Obviously, they have done uh, a fairly substantial analysis of strategic housing investment plans. Um, is the committee is very well. I've become a bit anorakish myself um, in that regard. Um, and it's good to see that their analysis um, is not uh, that much different to our own. But just briefly, then, the, the manifesto says clearly that it is, it's about building. But I'm just wondering, is 96% or 62%? What, what would you like... Or are you saying you're going to you're leaving this to local authorities to decide how best to fix that balance? Convener, uh, as I have said, it is up to local authorities through their local housing strategies um, and other strategies to come up with what is best for their area um, in terms of delivering uh, on the 50,000 homes uh, target. 
Um, I don't have uh, those numbers uh, off the top of my head and I would have to go and look uh, again at the uh, report from Shelter and compare it with our own analysis. Um, I will write to the committee if, uh, if I can uh, around about those numbers. But the key thing in all of this, this is about local delivery, uh, about meeting local need um, and local authorities should be doing uh, what is best uh, for the people in their area uh, to expand the amount of housing um, that is available um, for social rent, to expand the amount of affordable housing overall. Good evening, Simpson. Thanks, Convener. Uh, <coughs> morning, Minister. Um, just a, a couple of areas I want to explore, and that's uh, housing for older people and uh, housing for disabled people, if that's okay. Um, I've, I've asked you um, a number of uh, written questions um, over the months. I don't expect you to remember them. Um, Probably. But um, uh, re relating to the uh, refreshed uh, strategy for older people's yep. housing. Um, now, um, you, you started off, uh, you, t you told me, uh, that it, it would be published. This was last year. You told me it, it would be published later last year. Uh, then uh, it became spring of this year. And your latest answer is that this will be published sometime this parliamentary term. So uh, can you tell us when when this refresh strategy will be published? Um, convener, if we're talking about the local housing strategy, um, there is uh, uh, the guidance for the local housing strategy, uh, then, you know, there's work ongoing at this moment and that my expectation uh, is that that refresh will be completed uh, by the end of this year. If we look um, at our commitments in a fairer Scotland uh, for disabled people, um, we said that we would uh, refresh that strategy. Uh, obviously, um, uh, many members uh, will have seen the report last week. Um, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission um, around about housing for disabled people um, across the UK. Um, there were a number of recommendations uh, within that report which were applicable um, to Scotland. Um, so I want to ensure um, that we get the guidance absolutely right uh, on all of this um, so that we are providing uh, delivering more homes, more wheelchair accessible homes in particular, um, to meet the needs of folk right across the country. Um, but beyond that, um, convener, I don't think that we should be necessarily reliant on the refresh of guidance for strategies alone. Um, I think that the common sense approach needs to take place um, uh, and local authorities uh, need to look at the information and the data that they have uh, already in terms of formulating uh, what is required in their area to meet the needs of disabled people. Um, so they have the ability to look at their current housing waiting lists and could ask housing associations in their area for the same um, uh, to see exactly what is required uh, and get on with the job of delivery. Um, as I've said to the committee previously, um, while I am unwilling uh, to open up the can of worms that is negotiations around about subsidy, uh, what I have told local authorities um, is that they can talk to my officials around about subsidy rates for specialised housing or for larger housing types um, so that we can get go ahead and ensure that delivery um, in, place, in places right across the country. As it stands at the moment, 91% um, of the housing that we're delivering through the Affordable Housing Programme um, is housing for varying need. Um, so we are future-proofing uh, what we are building um, at this moment in time. I recognise that um, there is a way to go here. Um, I don't want to um, uh, rush this. I want to make sure that we get it right. But beyond the reliance on the guidance and the strategy itself, I want local authorities to take the common sense approach and see exactly uh, what waiting lists in their area show uh, in order for them uh, to make plans to deliver. Thank you. Um, I, I will ask you about the housing for disabled, but the, my first question was specifically about uh, the review of housing for older people. 
just just yeah. just older people. Okay. So, uh, are we clear that that refresh is going to be this year? Um, that refresh, um, I will, I will write to you, f giving you a definite of when that is due. Um, that is uh, a piece of work. Sorry, I picked you up there uh, wrong, Mr. Simpson. That is a piece of work which we do jointly um, with COSLA. There's a joint sign-off, if I remember rightly. I don't want to um, mislead the committee by giving a date um, that is not completely accurate. So I will write to the committee and let you know when that is due for publication. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, so I'll now ask about disabled, housing for disabled people. And you mentioned uh, the report uh, which came out last week from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, UK-wide, but uh, they did split it down in, into um, the, the, the various countries of the UK. Um, and it made for pretty grim reading, let's be honest, uh, across the UK. Um, so it says, disabled people uh, report a severe shortage of accessible houses across all tenures. Disabled people can experience serious deterioration in their mental well-being due to living in unsuitable accommodation. Um, and then Scotland specific, um, uh, uh, quoting again, until recently building standards in Scotland have produced houses that are generally inaccessible, particularly for people who use wheelchairs. The result is that in Scotland only 0.7% of uh, Scottish local authority housing and 1.5% of housing managed, managed by registered social house landlords is accessible for wheelchair users um, and it makes the point that councils don't set targets um, for accessible housing um, and calls for I think it's a 10% target. I wonder if you do um, uh, share the concern first of all uh, and agree that there should there should be targets. Um, convener, I welcome um, the report from the EHCR and uh, we will consider uh, their recommendations very carefully and de indeed. Um, the government believes that everyone uh, should have a, a home that suits uh, their needs, uh, whether uh, that's a home that's the right size, the right loc location or the flexibility. Um, and as I pointed out uh, previously, 91% you know, of the homes that we are delivering uh, at this moment in time in the social programme are housing for varying needs, which made, makes it easier uh, to make adaptation in the future if that's required. Um, I've made uh, no bones about the fact that I want to see more wheelchair accessible housing delivered throughout Scotland, and that's one of the reasons why um, I've told uh, local authorities uh, on numerous occasions um, that there is flexibility around about subsidy to deliver heat in, in this in this sphere. Um, and Mr. Simpson says um, there are no targets. Well, if you look at the strategic housing investment plans um, of uh, many of the local authorities, uh, they do set out their ambitions. Um, and I, although the um, EHRC uh, uh, report uh, talks about a 10% target, I have to be honest, convener, and say that I don't want, I don't necessarily want to see an arbitrary figure plucked from the air around about what is required. Um, and if I remember rightly, um, convener, I think it's Angus Council's strategic housing investment plan um, that states 16% um, of the housing that they're, they're delivering should be for specialist need. So I would like local authorities, rather than just pick uh, an arbitrary target or for us to set an arbitrary target at a national level, I would like local authorities uh, to get down to the job of seeing exactly what is required in their area and build that in to their strategic housing investment plans in the future. The refresh of the local housing strategies uh, guidance uh, will set out um, our ambition um, in that regard and our expectation. Uh, but beyond that, I do think that what is required is that logical approach uh, for councils uh, and housing associations to use the data that's already available to them 
in terms of who is on their waiting lists um, to, to set out what uh, they actually uh, need to do in that regard. Um, the EHRC report um, includes a, a number of recommendations and um, my intention um, is to talk to stakeholders uh, around about uh, a number of these things. I've already um, met on two occasions, once before the publication of this report um, and once after the publication of this report um, with Jean Freeman, who obviously um, is the minister responsible for the del delivery of our disability plan. Uh, she wants to get this right. I want to get this right. Um, and we will look very carefully indeed at all of the recommendations uh, that is in that EHRC e e report uh, to try and ensure that we better um, the lives of many uh, folk who currently uh, are not in suitable housing. Uh, convener, I've got questions on other areas, but that's it for disabled. Yeah. We'll take you back in a little bit later. Well, that's fine. Uh, Mr Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Minister. Morning. Affordable housing means different things to different groups and different individuals. Uh, it would be good to know what uh, the Scottish Government define as affordable housing. Um, the uh, Scottish Government uh, planning policy uh, defines affordable housing broadly uh, as housing of a reasonable quality that is affordable to people on modest incomes. Uh, this includes social rented accommodation, uh, mid-market rented accommodation, shared ownership, shared equity, discounted low-cost housing for sale, including plots for self-build, and low-cost housing without subsidy. Um, affordable housing in the context of the 50,000 affordable homes target includes home for social rent and mid-market rent, as well as homes for low-cost home ownership. I'm sorry for reading that out, convener, but I thought I would just state it as it uh, actually it, it is written. Th thank you, convener, uh, and thank you, minister. That does give an explanation. When we talk about affordable rent as well, you've itemised that it, within that definition, a number of categories come forward from that. Uh, and within the, the report tackling child poverty, the plan, we talk about uh, working with partnerships uh, to ensure that that does become the case. Can I ask for some examples of what you are actually doing in partnership to ensure that we do have that affordable rent? Um, convener, first of all, I, I should say that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to ending child poverty. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're currently looking at what's driving costs for social landlords uh, and to examine together um, the opportunity to reduce um, these costs. Uh, we'll support the sector um, to expand its own uh, improvement, innovation and efficiency work. Uh, and we are working with um, uh, partners uh, in, the, uh, in the social housing sphere um, to understand how savings can be made. For example, even within the affordable housing program itself without reducing quality uh, to ensure um, you know that we can do our very best in terms of investing uh, while keeping uh, rents at a, an affordable level. It is convener up to um, local authorities themselves um, to, uh, to assess a, a number of these things. It is up to housing associations uh, themselves to set rent levels. Obviously, we have um, uh, rules around about uh, these bodies consulting uh, with tenants uh, around about uh, affordability um, and around about increases in rent. I know that in certain places in the last little while, there have been some folk that have been unhappy um, with the rent rises that have been proposed in their areas. Um, in some of those cases, the housing associations um, have, uh, have looked at that again and have reduced um, the increase. Um, we are committed to continue to look at this. Uh, my officials, a combination of my officials um, and uh, others, 
um, uh, are looking in depth. We will continue to have discussions with partners uh, to ensure what we can do um, to help the sector itself um, reduce costs um, and uh, that hopefully will keep the rents lower. I think you know you, you make a very valid point that it's very important to have that dialogue between yourselves and the associations and the housing uh, sector to ensure that that does become the case. Because what people have seen is a year-on-year -year increase, uh, and that has has taken place. But I would ask about the, the housing affordability and your budget priorities for the future. Uh, how do you see that balancing to ensure that you capture uh, and you maintain and retain that system? Um, as we um, expand in terms of um, the programme and, and we deliver, obviously um, one of the things that will happen there is that it will give people more options in terms of where they live. Um, and while we're touching upon um, some of the difficulties, um, the, the, the small amount of difficulties, I would say, um, that there are within the social sector around about rents, um, I, I do not hear many people in the social center, uh, in the social sector, um, talking um, a, a, a about rent increases to the degree um, that I do uh, in terms of those folks who um, are currently in the private rented sector. Um, and you know, as we continue uh, to deliver uh, more social housing, I think that gives folk the ability uh, to maybe shift from. Uh, the private rented sector into the social sector, thus reducing uh, their rents. The other thing uh, about rent itself um, is the difficulty that there has been um, with um, uh, welfare reform um, and, uh, of course, um, the uh, cap um, that has been put in place. And obviously, we are seeing um, some difficulties already um, in places where universal credit has been rolled out in Scotland, particularly around about the Inverness area uh, and East Lothian. Um, and, you know, I would ask the um, UK government to look uh, again at its benefit cap policy, um, to look again at uh, how universal credit is having uh, a major impact in some folks' lives. Uh, and of course, um, I would also like them to look again um, at the local housing allowance, um, which has been capped um, for a number of years, because I think these things uh, are causing major difficulty um, uh, to rent payers in Scotland. Okay, Jericho. Thank you, Just as a follow-up then to Alexander Stewart's line of questioning there, um, the Chartered Institute for Housing Research has shown that since 2012 there's been a growing gap between local, the local housing allowance and the rent paid out. Um, the government's obviously concerned then in Scotland about the affordability of private rented housing, as you've alluded to, and particularly in light of benefit reforms. But I wonder then what conversations you might have had with UK government equivalents, perhaps, on this specific point. Um, we have had a number of concerns for a while. Um, I've stated those concerns uh, in the chamber and I think previously here at committee. Um, and I'm certainly not backward at coming forward um, uh, in telling the UK government what I, I think and the opportunities that I have had um, talking um, with uh, counterparts. Um, you know, th the solution uh, to all of these issues is currently uh, in the hands of the DWP and the UK government. If we look at LHA rates, which Ms. Ms. Gulreath uh, has pointed out, um, they're ca calculated on behalf of the DWP according uh, to its criteria. Um, and uh, I think that that criteria um, uh, has uh, uh, caused major damage uh, to many families right across the country. Um, it has been said that 2019-20 uh, will be the last year of the uh, freeze and uprating. We'll wait and see if that's the case or not. But the, Because the UK government has yet to announce uh, what approach they are going to take um, after that. Um, I think it's quite simple. I think that the UK government um, has to uh, allow LHA rates to return 
to the true 30th percentile, um, which is the definition that was there before. Um, to stop that freeze, to recognise that rents have risen, um, uh, and that in some places uh, in Scotland, you know, um, it is impossible um, for folk uh, to pay their rents um, uh, with uh, this current uh, LHA uh, allowance that is in place. Um, if the committee uh, wants more detail uh, on the criteria that is set by the UK government, I don't have that at my fingertips, uh, but again, I'm more than willing to supply um, the committee with any information that they may require in that regard. That would be helpful, I think, yeah. Minister. Um, I'd like to go back then to talk about child poverty. I know you mentioned that in one of your previous responses with regard to the government's tackling poverty um, delivery plan. And it notes that it will ensure that future affordable housing supply decisions support our objective to achieve a real and sustained impact on child poverty. And you spoke earlier about the refresh of local housing uh, strategy guidance and notes that it will ensure that local authorities take a robust evidence based approach to the identification of specific housing needs. I suppose my question then is how will you monitor that local authorities do target what they're doing in terms of tackling child poverty around about that house building? Well, what we're doing uh, at this moment, and I'm glad that you've mentioned the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, um, as I, I alluded to in a, a previous answer, um, we're working on, on stakeholder engagement uh, on the action to work with the, the social sector um, to agree the best ways to keep rents affordable. Uh, and that will fully involve uh, COSLA, uh, the Association of Local Authority, uh, Chief Housing Officers, uh, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, uh, the Glasgow uh, and West of Scotland Forum in the development of this work. Um, obviously, um, those discussions in terms of coming up with the best way forward will also have discussions around about how we monitor uh, all of this um, as we go forward. Um, the government is very grateful uh, to partners in terms of the level of cooperation um, that there has been on many of these difficult issues. Um, and we want to continue to ensure that we consult fully, uh, not only in terms of implementation, but again, how we monitor that in the future. Um, so we will put the flesh and the bones of all of that, and I'm quite sure that the committee uh, will no doubt in future be asking us how we're getting on with that discussions uh, and how we are going to actually uh, deliver uh, on that uh, scenario of trying to keep rents as low as possible and to decrease uh, child poverty and other po poverty uh, streams by, by getting this right. Just as a, a final uh, supplementary to that, um, the government's aspirations around about closing the attainment gap seem to be intrinsically linked then to what we're doing in terms of child poverty here. So I wonder perhaps if the local housing strategy guidance might consider how pupil equity funding links to what's happening in the housing sector. And I know that's predicated on free school meal entitlement. Is that a measure that you might consider looking at tying up to, to what we're doing on housing here? Um, it's a very interesting point that Ms Gilreath makes um, and I think that many of the difficulties that we face uh, in various aspects um, of life, including um, the attainment gap, um, uh, is uh, entirely driven um, by poverty. Um, I will certainly consider um, what Ms Gilreath has said here today uh, and reflect on, uh, on that. Um, and we'll get back to you on, on what we do in that regard. Um, but I think that Ms Gorreath makes a, a, a very good point there. OK. Can I just check something on affordability? Um, so, housing associations and local authorities have got a significant degree of flexibility and independence in how they, 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 they review their rents and what their rent structuring policy is, and they, they consult, obviously, in, in relation to that. And I, I'd previously thought, I think it used to be, by convention, I think they often look at RPI, as an underlying rate of, of inflation and RPI plus one was a kind of conventional thing they used to do quite a lot when setting rent levels. Uh, a number I can actually, the other day, some constituents uh, met myself and they said that one of the concerns they had was that UK government benefits were often predicated in CPI, uh, which 
which runs about 1.2% less than RPI, but you've got the Housing Association movement using RPI as an indicator, so you've actually got a kind of widening inequality in terms of affordability uh, in relation to rents. Now, given the fact that this Parliament has got control over a small amount of, of benefits, and the UK Parliament a significant amount of benefits, and you've previously mentioned uh, universal credit and other aspects of the benefit system, I'm just wondering if there's maybe more consideration the Scottish Government could give in relation to whether what guidance there should be to local authorities in relation to how they set their rent levels and what guidance or what representations we can make to the UK government and how they get their, their, their benefits, including in what benefits levels, right? Because we're using RPI uh, for people in social housing but uh, when their costs are going up, but we're using CPI when their benefits go up. Increasingly every year, rent gets harder to pay. Um, it is... Uh it is kind of difficult for me to sit here, convener, um, and talk about what individual housing associations uh, may base their rent increases uh, on. Um, I know that in terms of um, the Private Housing Tenancies Act in 2016, um, when it came to uh, our decisions around about um, rent pressure zones, um, we, um, in that legislation, talked about capping rent increases at a minimum of CPI plus um, 1%. Um, I know um, a, a number of places um, have have gone uh, in recent times uh, with CPI. Um, of course, again, convener, it's not up to um, government to dictate to, um, to registered social landlords uh, what they do in these regards. After all, we've just uh, we're in the process of putting through the housing amendment bill. This is these are decisions um, for them um, to make. Um, uh, I would. I've got a table in front of me, um, convener, which I could read out in terms of uh, relevant social rent benchmarks and assumptions um, that have been made uh, over the piece. Um, I think... For your own don't read out from, from that table. I, I think... Cause I, want to let, I, I appreciate the additional detail you were going to give. I'm conscious other members will want to get in with questions as well. I think it's just the hope that there's a collegiate approach with local authorities and housing associations as they independently set their rent levels and what best practice guidance might look around that. But actually, the other side of the coin, the other side was about the UK government and to a lesser extent this government when we set or the UK government sets benefits levels uh, about the divergence between one cost pressure and one, one income supplement diverging? Is that something maybe but in partnership with Gene Friedman you could look at? I, I think it's something that the UK government needs to look at in some depth as it does uh, over all of its benefits including all of the, the housing benefit scenarios which they're still responsible for. Um, convener, if it is helpful, um, what we do is we routinely publish guidance at the start of each financial year uh, which ad advises, um, advises RSLs uh, and councils uh, of that social rent benchmark assumptions. Um, and, you know, I can send you um, the in-depth details, including the tables that I have in front of me, so that gives you um, a, a, a better indication um, of, of, of what is going on um, out there. Well, thanks, Minister. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, Convener. I just want to touch on uh, rural housing uh, for a moment, Minister. Um, in 2016-17, um, about 17% of Scotland's population lived in rural and island areas. But only about half that proportion of affordable houses was built. And what we have in rural Scotland is wages that are below average. We have rents that are above average. And clearly, if there is no... Um, equalisation in terms of share of housing being built in rural Scotland that puts more pressure on uh, uh, the towns because people have to migrate to get affordable housing and also aids depopulation and, and makes it more difficult for in the long term for the delivery of services in rural areas. Now I know there's a rural housing fund but, uh, but what can we do to actually try and reverse that trend and ensure that uh, rural and island Scotland gets a level of investment? in affordable housing that it deserves, at least in terms of its share of population. 
Um, first of all, convener, I should say that the resource planning assumptions that are given to local authorities um, don't break down into um, uh, rural or urban. Um, and I know that m many local authorities have that rural uh, and urban mix, but they are responsible for um, the local investment and for um, deciding um, where um, that housing um, should be built. Um, but I've been uh, pretty robust in terms of uh, saying to people that they need to look at all factors um, uh, that exist in their particular area. Um, and, you know, there are opportunities which are, arise um, and uh, councils should be looking um, at ever-changing um, scenarios um, that go on. Um, Probably a good example, um, convener, would be um, Highland Council, um, where you know uh, there were a lot of folks who were saying that the emphasis um, was largely around about the Inverness area itself. Um, I think that that has changed, um, and I think that continues to change. Uh, we have seen opportunities um, in terms of economic growth in Fort William, um, and there has been a re-emphasis there. Um, there has obviously uh, been um, quite a, a lot um, of uh, stories around about um, the sky in Loch Aber area uh, and the major boost in tourism that there has been there, which is pressure put pressure um, in affordable uh, and social housing um, in these places. And I'm glad to see that Highland Council um, has uh, adapted, um, is looking much more at the Loch Aber area and Fort William. Um, and certainly we're about to see um, some major uh, investment from uh, uh, Sky and La Hauche, uh, Housing Association and Sky. Um, as I uh, go about the country, um, as you know, I'm prone to do. You know, I am challenging local authorities around about um, their plans, um, uh, and you know, talking to folks to see exactly what uh, is required. And I would hope that um, all local authorities um, will. Uh, listen to the populace at large about what's required um, and will adjust um, uh, their plans uh, accordingly. Um, after all, uh, in certain uh, rural areas, um, you know, um, the ad additional housing may mean um, the school staying open or some other community f facility um, staying open. Uh, but these are matters for local authorities in fairness, I would say um, that most of them um, are getting much better at this. Just to follow that up, I mean, one of the issues, of course, in rural and island um, areas is that it's much more expensive to build. So, for example, I know that in Monken City and St. of Arran, it's, and of course, the Island of Cumbria, it can be anything from 25 to 50 percent more expensive to actually construct a house because materials uh, and workers have to be brought over and sometimes they have to be housed uh, during the working week. That obviously creates a disincentive for local authorities and indeed registered social landlords because they can build more houses for the same money on the mainland, frankly. And when we're talking about numbers, they obviously want to do that, but that, that makes it difficult for island communities to get the housing they need. So what can we do to incentivise and deliver a level playing field in island and rural communities so that, that disincentive for local authorities and registered social landlords is minimised? Uh, convener, uh, once again, um, I'm going to touch upon the, the subsidy scenario, uh, and I keep saying that I'm not going to change subsidy levels, and I'm not. Uh, but again, it's one of those areas where you know um, uh, local authorities, housing associations, uh, can have discussions uh, with uh, my officials around about subsidy level um, for remote, rural, and island communities. I recognise, you know, that it costs um, more. 
uh, to build uh, in certain places. Uh, often you've got to bring the skills, the skills on island because they're not there. I would hope that we could build up the skills uh, on the islands. And uh, you know, uh, one of the things about this pipeline of work is that hopefully we will be able to to do that in many places. But we recognise that it is more costly. Um, uh, some of the projects. Um, that have been completed with subsidy in recent times have received um, fairly substantial uh, levels of subsidy, um, but we were keen uh, to see those projects go ahead. Probably one of the best examples of that is um, Alva Ferry um, uh, on Mull, um, where a, 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 a couple of houses there, uh, you know, were immensely costly compared to uh, building even in other parts of Mull, uh, is, is my understanding. We recognise that that's the case. Uh, my officials uh, on the ground uh, take a common sense approach um, to all of this, um, and it is getting the local authorities uh, to have those discussions to get what's right, whether that be in Arran or, or Cumbria um, or um, uh, uh, Mull or maybe even Alva at a point. Thank you very much. I'd like to come in later if possible with another okay. area, if that's Absolutely. possible. Uh, Mr Whiteman, you have some supplementaries in that area? Yeah, just on the, on the rural, as you're aware, you uh, helpfully supplied some data to this committee last year, which was analysed by the Rural Housing Service, um, who claim as a result of that analysis that 72% 70 of new homes in the affordable housing supply programme that were classified as rural were actually built in urban areas. Now, I know there's some disagreement about the numbers, and I don't propose to... Um, enter into those disagreements uh, at the moment. But could you, uh, f for statistical accuracy, could you commit to publishing this data rather than a simple urban-rural split, publishing it on the basis of the six-fold urban-rural classification in future, so there's at least some understandable data? Um, convener, I think... If I remember rightly, Mr. Whiteman may have asked a similar um, written question of me previously. Um, and I think that there may be some difficulties in terms of uh, some of that data gathering. I don't want to commit myself uh, to doing something that I uh, cannot necessarily do easily. Um, what I will do um, is have a, a look at that situation uh, and get back to um, the committee with what is possible and what is not. OK, that's extremely helpful. I'll leave it there in the rural. Come back. I'd like to ask some questions on affordability, but maybe come back. Well, why, why don't you... Fire away just now. Just now. And just, <laughs> just to give a heads up for members, we've got about 20 minutes left of this session, so if you get something specific you want to ask, catch my eye so we can get it put in the last 20 minutes or so. OK, thanks very much, Convener. Yes, coming back to the question of affordability, um, I mean, you, you, you laid out the government's definition of affordable housing as being one based on the planning system and based on um, tenure, but growing, for growing numbers of particularly young people, um, shared ownership, social rents not available to them, even so-called affordable homes, 80% of mid market rent is not affordable. I, and I think the committee, are aware of the difficulties in defining affordability based on incomes. I mean, I don't minimise the difficulties, but would you consider redefining what you mean by affordable housing in policy terms to move away from a very vague planning and tenure base to something that's more akin to people's real lived experience about what it costs to afford housing? Um, convener, um, the anorak that I am, um, I've looked at um, uh, a huge amount of discussion, academic papers, um, and what could be termed as general argument about how you would define affordability. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, that we could spend a very, very long time indeed um, uh, trying to define something which is, in some cases, um, almost uh, undefinable. Um, I would rather get on uh, with the business um, of delivering 
Um, and I think that one of the key things uh, in all of this um, is increasing the supply, and particularly the supply um, of socially rented housing, uh, will put, uh, 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 well, will allow uh, more folks to ask, uh, access that, uh, thus it becoming uh, more uh, affordable. Um, you know, um, I'm quite sure um, that the committee itself will have looked at uh, various academic papers um, and uh, will have uh, probably partaken in some of the arguments around about how you define affordability. Uh, I think what we have at the moment, um, while it's not ideal, uh, gives us a, a, a fairly good uh, setting uh, for all of this. Um, I don't know how long it would take uh, for us to reach agreement about uh, a definition uh, and whether that definition would necessarily last, last five minutes. Um, the reality quite simply is that in terms of affordability uh, itself, uh, what may be affordable uh, to us as individuals today uh, might not be affordable to us because of ever-changing circumstances tomorrow. So I would rather concentrate on delivery um, rather than uh, having a, a huge ramy uh, about de definition. So I'm, I'm not proposing a huge ramy. I mean, I acknowledge it's difficult. My, my point was that the current definition talks about being affordable to people on modest incomes. So it mentions modest incomes, um, but then goes on to talk about a tenure-based approach. And I'm, all I'm suggesting is that the by, 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 by using the term affordable housing, it is increasingly becoming disconnected with people's everyday experience of how affordable housing is. So I'm, I'm not suggesting we have a big ramy about what is affordable. What I'm suggesting is we move away at least to something that is more akin, still not perfect, but more akin to people's everyday understanding about what is affordable for people on modest incomes. I'm a pragmatic man, as you well know, convener, um, but I would rather spend time on delivery rather than um, concentrating my efforts uh, on, on, on this kind of scenario. Um, you know, if somebody came up with a, a, a definition which uh, uh, was um, uh, different uh, from this one, you know, I'd have a look at it. Um, but, you know, um, in all honesty, I want to concentrate on delivery rather than having arguments around about definition because I don't think um, that, you know, Lots of folk don't agree with this. Um, lots of folk don't uh, agree with many of the other definitions that have been put forward by academics and others. You know, we have what we have. I'd rather concentrate on delivery. Okay, I think you've had your answer. It might not be the answer you wanted, Mr. Whiteman, but I think you've, you've certainly had it. Certainly, the papers we looked at, there was a, it was hotly debated what how what the definition would would, would look like. So, but thank you for raising it, Mr. Whiteman. I don't uh, know what papers you've seen, convener, but I probably I would imagine that they're probably not that much different to some of the stuff that I've read previously. Um, yeah, yeah, but but, but um, yeah, it is an issue, so it's important to raise it, Mr. Simpson. Thanks. <clears throat> um, just a, a couple of quick questions. Uh, have any councils? Uh, have any councils yet applied applied to set up rent pressure zones? Uh, there have not been any formal uh, uh, indications to the government, but I do know that a number of local authorities um, are looking at this, but there has been no um, formal intentions made by any local authority, unless that's happened in the no. last few days. And I'm up, no, no, no. Do you know which councils are, are looking at it? Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, because of press reports, Edinburgh, um, Glasgow, um, beyond that, um, I know that uh, others uh, have been talking about it, um, but I don't know how far advanced uh, the others would be in that regard. Okay. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is about the Warm Homes Bill, which was, of course was a, an SNP uh, manifesto uh, commitment. That now appears to have been dropped. Am I, I could be wrong on that. No, but, um, um, the uh, fuel poverty um, uh, target, um, I can't remember the right uh, name of the bill, forgive me, um, convener, um, will be introduced uh, before the summer alongside the fuel poverty strategy. Sorry, are we talking about something that's going to be called... Uh, fuel, fuel poverty target definition and strategy Scotland bill. And that will set the new definition and a new statutory fuel poverty target. So, 
Yeah. Uh, 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 um I wish I had more of a say in these things, but obviously the name of a bill has got to be um, neutral and acceptable to um, uh, to um, the presiding officer. So, so let's, uh, just, that's let's the bill. just call it the fuel poverty bill. So yep. that 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 is not the warm homes bill. So the warm homes bill has been dropped. Uh, no, uh, what we have said um, uh, right throughout is that we will do this in two stages. Uh, the first one is the fuel poverty uh, bill, we'll just call it that, and that will drive forward the provision of support to those who are most in need, uh, no matter where they live in Scotland. Um, that, of course, uh, will go alongside the fuel poverty strategy, uh, which will be published um, at the same time, uh, and that will... Uh, 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 outline um, our aims to uh, maximise the number of homes uh, reaching EPC ban status um, and to target support um, and enable actions. Um, as the committee is well aware, we've already set out uh, a number of standards for social housing and private sector landlords, um, uh, and that bill will also spell out uh, what is required in terms of the owner-occupied sector. Um, so that will be published before summer. Right, I hear that. It's just for clarity, convener, so we're not going to have something called the Warm Homes Bill? No, you're having something called the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Scotland right. Bill, which I would much rather have called the Warm Homes Bill. OK, so why, why the change? Um, because uh, the Warm Homes Bill um, itself uh, would not have been a title that would have been accepted, is my understanding. Can I just check with us something? What would be helpful if there was a, a suggestion that there were two different pieces of legislation, if that's what Mr Simpson was thinking, it would be quite helpful, I'm sure when the bill is presented to Parliament, that it's made clear what aspects of what Mr Simpson was thinking the Warren's Homes Bill will have been incorporated in the in the fuel poverty legislation. And we can I, I, I don't think, think we're talking that, about anything different, yeah. but, you know, um, I'll outline... Um, in writing all of the detail yeah. of what we're going to do in the next the, couple of weeks. I mean, that would be the concern uh, of, of, of myself and, and indeed stakeholders, that it, uh, it becomes something different to, to what we expected? No, no, no. So it's um, just a change of name? I, I would much pre prefer it to have been called the Warm Homes Bill, um, but that's not where we're at. Um, uh, the minister will, will, will scrutinise the content rather than the, the uh, name. Uh, uh, absolutely. The content is key, convener, to all of this. Do you want to follow up with some of that, Mr Simpson? That's fine. OK. Kenneth Gibson? Uh, Thank you, convener. The rental income guarantee scheme was launched on the 12th of October last year to boost investment um, uh, in um, building um, houses to rent. I'm just... Um, Wondering what kind of progress has been made so far in terms of the, the delivery of this uh, going forward? Um, um, expanding uh, the build to rent sector as part of the um, Greater More Homes Scotland uh, uh, approach um, and is uh, a, a key element in terms of um, the strategy that we have for the private rented sector. Um, last October, uh, we uh, launched a, a, a package which I think was pretty well received, um, enabling measures to stimulate growth um, in this sector um, and to attract investment in the build to rent market here. Um, as part of that package, we have offered uh, changes in terms of planning advice, uh, taxation, uh, obviously, we've explained uh, the tenancy uh, reform uh, situation that we've gone through here and, the, um, of course, the rental income guarantee scheme, which uh, Mr Gibson has mentioned in his, uh, uh, in his question. Um, Scottish Futures Trust um, have uh, had uh, quite a, a number of uh, meetings and kept a close co contact with developers. Uh, and investors and lenders, um, and uh, I'm told that there has been pretty positive feedback uh, around about that. Um, but as things progress, um, I'm more than happy to keep the committee informed of developments. 
I mean, obviously, it's, it's just just over seven months since that was launched, but I'm just wondering if there's any indication of the numbers of additional privately rented uh, homes that are going to be built either in this financial year or indeed next as a direct sure. result of this policy. Sure, um, that's, that's um, difficult. Obviously, um, in Aberdeen, um, the Dandara scheme there is um, complete, um, which is, um, I, I, I think, the first in Scotland. I know that there are currently a series of, series of sites in, in Glasgow um, that are seeking planning permission, and if you excuse me, I won't talk uh, to any great degree about the planning permission um, um, itself. Um, I think platform at Finiston, um, Pitt Street is another one in Glasgow. Um, in Edinburgh, um, we have uh, Moda Apache at Fountain Bridge. Um, and in Dundee um, um, at Whiteburn. Uh, but I don't have any more detail um, than that for, for Mr Gibson. And I'm sweared um, to talk about sites where planning permission may be being sought at this moment. OK, well, thanks. But it looks as if some progress has been made. Can I just ask one final question, convener, which is uh, that um, on the 20th of December, the Cabinet Secretary uh, told the committee that he's considering using funding from the financial transactions to support a building Scotland fund, which will have a prominent housing and infrastructure process. I'm just wondering uh, where we are with that. Um, there have been discussions uh, between um, uh, members of uh, my housing innovation team um, and others who are helping uh, to establish um, the Scottish National Investment Bank. Obviously, the uh, £150 million Bu Building Scotland Fund um, is seen as a precursor to the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, the the monies itself uh, will be available to non-public sector organisations, as the committee is probably aware, um, and will provide uh, either debt or equity capital. Um, and uh, you know we are at the early stages uh, of this. Um, there are uh, a lot of discussions going on between the housing innovation team and others um, within government to get this absolutely um, right. Thanks, Kavina. Okay. Can I just pick on something up or something, Minister? What, one of the, 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 the changes to the budget process is we now seek to, in this Parliament, is we now seek to use every opportunity to have a kind of a rolling programme of questions in relation to the budget. So one of the, the issues we raised in uh, the last financial year's budget was in relation to, to monies for adaptations. And obviously, we, this committee had wanted to make sure there was a 10-year ten, ten neutral approach to adaptations. But we had noted that the, the budget and the social rented sector out with local authorities, uh, housing associations effectively was uh, £10 million. It had been £10 million for some time, so it wasn't a cut, but it was, you know, it, it was kind of stuck there. And we tried to get some information, uh, and the government's been helpful in relation to this, in relation to the spending in the, of health and social care partnerships within integrated joint boards, but it was still a bit patchy what we were getting, so we found out for 16-17 it was just over £38 million for 23 of the integrated joint boards, so we didn't have the full picture. So obviously we are keen to make sure we have a 10-year neutral approach to adaptations that those in need, particularly in light of the, the, the disabled matters we were talking about in relation to, to housing provision. Um, so it would appear to to myself, anyway, we have to discuss it as a committee that £10 million does look like something that may have to shift at some point in the future, but we can't really gauge how much that should shift on a 10-year neutral basis if we don't really know how much integrated joint boards are spending in other house tenure type. So uh, any comments you have on that would be quite helpful. Um, I've probably got a fair amount of comments on that, um, convener. Um, I should say um, at the very outset, as I explained before, that the £10 million is additional government money that goes to RSLs um, for adaptations. Uh, and primary responsibility um, for housing adaptations rests, as you rightly point out, um, with um, integrated joint boards, health and social care partnerships. Um, they um, themselves 
uh, should be tenure blind in terms of uh, what they're doing. Um, and uh, I agree with you that in terms of the information uh, that I've provided uh, the committee, um, it is uh, patchy um, and I am not particularly happy um, with that situation. Uh, we will be going back to health and social care partnerships um, to uh, get them to have a, a hard look at what they're doing um, in this area. Um, uh, I was at a uh, tenants uh, event um, in Aberdeen on um, Saturday um, where there were tenants and residents from uh, a number of local authorities to have their um, regional AGM. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would be fair to say um, that while some folks were um, fairly complimentary about um, what was going on in their particular area, others were very unhappy indeed. Um, I think, you know, we have had a, a number of work streams going on in the area of ad adaptation. Um, we have had findings uh, from pilots that we've had. Uh, I'm going to look very closely um, at what may need to be done in terms of getting um, either the exporting of the best practice all over the place um, or uh, talking to colleagues to see um, if there is a, a need for additional guidance um, around about this. Um, my final point, convener, is a, a, a very simple one. Um, and, you know, there is the human cost um, of not getting this absolutely right. Um, but there is also a cost to the public purse um, of not doing this properly. Uh, because at the end of the day, if folk are not getting the right adaptations in their homes uh, to lead the independent lives that uh, uh, they all want to do, um, you know, uh, that is a, a burden uh, on the health service itself with additional cost of folk having to uh, go into hospital or into a care setting. So it is, uh, it is absolutely uh, the right thing to do, uh, the right thing to do for people, uh, but also the right thing to do for the public finances, um, for the health and social care partnerships, to bend spend to ensure that they get it right with adaptations. Okay, now I'm going to ask one final question, which maybe you can just give the information in writing. Might be helpful given time. And Mr. Whitener, I've, I've noted that you want in for a final question as well. But I mean, the £38 million pounds that, that I mentioned as an input uh, in relation to money for adaptations, as is the £10 million, pounds, we should really be measuring outcomes. So any information the government holds or is seeking to get on how that £10 million pounds or that £38 million pounds is spent in the most effective and efficient way, I think, would be would be very welcome as well. But also that connection that you pointed out, Minister, that, of course, there'll be more than £10 million spent in the social rented sector because health and social care boards are not precluded from yeah. investing in that sector. So it would be better to be able to understand the overall spend within that sector. Vital in my area, for example, where there really aren't any council houses, for example, which is quite good to get a bit of clarity around that. Any information you have, perhaps you could write to the committee in I, relation to? I, I don't think I would have very much more information than I've given you um, already in terms of budgeting. Um, what may be useful for the committee, uh, I don't know how easy it will be uh, for us to get our hands on it, um, but we, we will, um, is to give you uh, evidence of what difference um, an adaptation may make to individuals' lives. Um, and it's very difficult um, to, to gauge what the saving uh, would be, because obviously um, uh, that, that is, uh, is, is not entirely clear at points. But we'll, we'll provide you with what we can uh, in that regard. I don't think that you, uh, I, can be, I can provide you anything more at this moment in terms of budgets. Uh, but one of the things which the committee can be very assured of um, is that this is a, an area that I've got um, a, a very great interest in. And although not all of this falls within my portfolio, I will be doing all that I can with colleagues um, to make sure um, that we can see the best practice that's going on in certain places 
happening elsewhere because it is absolutely the right thing to do um, for people um, and uh, you know um, we will we will do what we can to get on top of it. I think that would be really helpful. It means when we get to the sharp end of budget scrutiny, we're not just looking at raw numbers, we're looking at the wider picture, which would be very uh -huh. helpful. So thank you very much. Mr Whiteman, brief final question? Just a couple of very brief questions. Uh, Minister, um, I had a meeting recently with the Scottish uh, Commission for Learning Disability who were concerned about um, specific guidance on planning for people with learning disabilities in relationship to housing. Um, I wonder if you could just confirm that you're aware of the report from October 2017 and are engaging and addressing some of those concerns? Um, I'm aware of the report. Um, if I remember rightly, Maureen Watt um, was at a meeting uh, with uh, SCLD um, in recent times and fed back a, a, a number of things from that. I was um, supposed to attend that meeting, but other business came up. Um, that's an area um, that we will look at. In terms of building standards, um, convener, as I've said to the committee before, at this moment in time, um, the resource of the building standards um, division um, is focusing on uh, the aftermath of uh, the tragedy at Grenfell and Co. Um, we will uh, reach soon um, the reports back from uh, the uh, independent panels that have been looking at fire, fire safety and building standards for us. Um, after that is work that work is done, we will get back on track to looking uh, at a, a number of these things that have uh, that have uh, come to our attention. Okay, that's helpful. And just finally, um, on the private rented sector, um, outcome number 30 in the Joint housing, housing Delivery Plan talks about more people choosing to rent in the private sector. Given that a lot of people are in the private rented sector at the moment don't want to be there, they'd rather be in the social rented sector, <coughs> after 35,000 more homes, they still won't be able to get a social rented home. So I'm just wondering if that more people choosing to rent is an, an absolute aspiration you want arithmetically more, or is it a, a relative more people, given that the percentage has increased, has trebled since 1999? Convener, I want to give people choice. Um, I want to give people the choice to live um, in a council or housing association home, if that's what they want to do. Um, I want to give people the choice uh, of whether they want to live in quality uh, private rented stock. I want to give people the choice of, of being able uh, to own their own home. Um, and people make different choices at different points in their lives, and it should be easy for folk uh, to move between whatever it is um, that they want to do. Uh, I know that there are folks who are in the private rented sector who don't want to be there. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're doing all that we can to increase the d delivery of uh, social housing across the country. Um, but I also know that there, there are a lot of folk um, who do uh, want to live uh, in the private rented sector. So it is all about giving people choice. Well, um, thank you very much. That brings us towards the, the end of, of this particular evidence session. In a moment, we're going to suspend briefly. Minister, you don't make your escape. You're sticking with us for the subsequent agenda item. But can I thank you for your evidence and for your two officials for coming along here uh, this morning. But we will suspend briefly before we move to agenda item three. So we've moved to suspend.
Okay, um, welcome back everyone and we move to agenda item 3 which is Code of Conduct for Councillors and the revised Code of Conduct SG forward slash 2018 forward slash 65 is to be approved by resolution of the Parliament so the committee's role is to consider it in the same way as it would any affirmative instrument. The committee will therefore take evidence on the revised code from the Minister at this item and then at, then at the follow item the committee will formally consider a motion to approve the revised code. So can I therefore welcome Kevin Stewart once more, uh, Minister for Local Government and Housing and now joined uh, with Mr Stewart is Brian Petty, Relationship Manager, Local Government Policy and Relationship Unit Scottish Government. Thank you both for joining us uh, Still this morning, I uh, can I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the proposed changes to uh, the Councillor's Code of Conduct. Uh, Mr Peddy's input might be necessary at uh, various points. He is the expert, uh, without a doubt, on the uh, Code of Conduct. Um, I've laid this revised version of the Code uh, before the Parliament primarily to address two issues. Uh, the first issue concerned the Code's rules and declarations of conflicts of interest. Um, we received representation that those rules were inhibiting councillors' ability uh, to represent councils on the boards of regional transport partnerships uh, and that this could adversely affect the effective working of those boards. Um, I should probably declare at this point that I was previously a chair of a regional transport partnership, NESTRANS. Uh, RTPs exist to strengthen the planning and delivery of regional transport developments uh, and it is important that councillors should be able to take part in their work uh, while still properly representing, representing those that elected them. Uh, the proposed amendments, uh, which were the subject of public consultation, are aimed at removing the unintended barriers uh, to achieving that aim whilst maintaining the general rules around conflicts of interest. Uh, the second issue uh, is to make it as clear as possible to councillors, uh, those who work with them and members of the public, uh, that bullying and harassment in any form will not be tolerated. Uh, despite the great progress that has been made in promoting and achieving equality, it is clear that more needs to be done. I and my colleagues are determined that any form of prejudice by anyone and wherever it exists should be stamped out. Uh, people are entitled to expect that elected councillors will not engage in unacceptable behaviour uh, and this proposed amendment to the code will make that crystal clear. Uh, this follows similar changes made by the First Minister earlier this year uh, to the Scottish Ministerial Code and I'm pleased to say that COSLA are fully supportive of the proposed change. Uh, it is also proposed to make some minor clarifying changes to the code uh, many of which reflect suggestions put to us by the Standards Commission. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we await the outcome of the Standards Committee, Committee inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct at the Parliament, uh, which includes considering the MSP's Code of Conduct. Uh, once that report, uh, that, once that inquiry has reported, uh, beg your pardon, uh, we'll consider where, whether any of its recommendations should be reflected in further changes to the Councillor's Code. And I will advise the Committee uh, once that consideration has taken in place. Um, I hope that that's helpful um, and Mr Peddy and I uh, are prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you Minister. I will move to those questions now. Um, Mr Simpson. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Um, Minister, um, we had the uh, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life, uh, Bill Thompson, before us. He's been before us a, a, a couple of times and a couple of fairly robust sessions. Um, members, uh, myself uh, in, in particular, have, have expressed concerns about, about this code and the way it's used, um, often in a vexatious manner, um, often in a politically motivated manner against councillors. Um, and I just wonder whether, whether you think um, that we, we should actually, rather than the sort of piecemeal um, reforms you've, you've, you've produced uh, today, uh, we should be looking at a, a root and branch look at this. Um, because we've, we as uh, MSPs have not had a chance to have an input into this process. This, this is it. 
Um, we will later today have a, a yes or no vote. We've not had a chance to amend any part of it. My concern, I'll come on, I'll come on to it, is what we'll be left with uh, could actually be even worse. Um, particularly if you look at the section on bullying and harassment uh, in, the, in the, the new proposed code, all it says is bullying or harassment is completely unacceptable and will be considered to be a breach of the code. Now, on the face of it, you might say, well, fair enough. But then how do you define bullying? How do you define harassment? Um, you know, I'd, I think this could open the floodgates. Uh, councillors, councillors complaining against other councillors in particular. He, he or she has harassed me. He or she has bullied me. Um, it's just not specific enough. What, what's your view on that? Um, I wrote to the convener earlier uh, on in the year, um, and I agree that uh, there may be uh, merit in a, a full review of the code. Um, it was last fully reviewed in 2010, um, and it must continue to uh, evolve to change uh, with times. Um, however, um, we don't currently have firm plans for a review. Um, we will consider the way forward uh, once the Standards Committee uh, has produced um, its report. Um, I think in terms of some of the general points that Mr Simpson has, uh, has made, you know, uh, having been uh, a councillor myself for a number of years, um, I'm aware that sometimes um, the code has been used for political purposes. We live in a, a political environment. Um, sometimes uh, looking at it, it has been um, a, a case in, in some points where um, complaints have been vexatious. Uh, but I think that that code, uh, those standards are required. In terms of the changes that we've made in terms of bullying and ha harassment, um, that is to be much more explicit uh, than what uh, was uh, in the code previously. Well, the problem is, Minister, it's not explicit at all. It's extremely vague. Um, it only uses the word bullying or harassment. Now, those two words can mean a, a many different things to, to many people. Do you not agree with my initial point is that this, this, it could open the floodgates? No, I don't agree with your initial point at all. Um, and I remember back to the very start of the publication um, of the councillor's code of conduct, um, where people at that time uh, were saying that it would open up the floodgates of complaints um, from members of the public and from other elected members about elected members. Um, and that did not happen. Um, but what it did do, I think, um, uh, and this is my own personal opinion, um, it did change certain behaviours um, in council chambers. Um, and I think that that was a, a good thing. Um, I think like any code, um, you know, in a political environment, um, there will be folks who um, will chance their arm at a point, which I don't think is uh, a particularly good thing to do in terms of growing up and mature politics. Um, but, you know, uh, I do think that we need a code, um, and I do think um, that it is absolutely right um, in the current circumstances that we are in um, uh, to actually uh, put emphasis uh, on uh, bullying and harassment. There's other members wanting in. There is an opportunity for a wider discussion at the next item on the agenda, but yet yeah, on, on, on this theme. So you can continue it further if you want, Mr Simpson, but you will have another opportunity. It's up to you, convener. I'm, I'm going to ask questions about another part of the code. Okay, Mr. So Gibson, do you want to come in relation well, to this? Just actually, I mean, yeah. I, I agree with, with with the minister that you know we have to move with the times, and it's important issues such as bullying and harassment are covered. But you can't just use a couple of words like that. I, I, I think um, what what is bullying and harassment to someone else, certainly bullying, could just be a robust exchange of views. I mean, 
you know, and then somebody says, oh, you know, you're bullying me. I mean, I mean, you really have to put more detail. There has to be um, a lot, meat, uh, some meat on the bones if people are going to know what the parameters of this is, quite frankly, because it's not just about protecting some council from vexatious complaints. It's about showing people who genuinely are bullied and harassment are taken seriously. So I think there's a balance to be struck here. And the form of words that's going to be used in the code, I think, is frankly just just Disney, Disney um, meet the, the, the required uh, standard. Uh, <coughs> I, I yeah. will do, um, uh, convener. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, taken from the changes uh, to the ministerial code. As I say, that was agreed by uh, COSLA. Um, I understand that it was agreed by uh, COSLA leaders. Um, I'm getting the nod of the head from Brian there. Um, uh, so they have uh, uh, agreed that. As I say, we will go back and look again after the Standards Committee um, has reported. Uh, but many people uh, wanted um, a, a change to reflect uh, what is currently going on um, uh, uh, in society. Uh, and beyond that, you know... Um, as I say, the First Minister agreed to um, change the ministerial code, and that is uh, a reflection uh, of that change. Mr Stewart. Thank you, convener. Minister, I think nobody is disagreeing with you that we have to be alive to the fact uh, that in a political environment, uh, individuals have their own views and opinions, and sometimes that can become heated. But... When you're looking at this code, and we acknowledge the fact that the code was brought in to protect uh, councillors and to protect their integrity and officials around them to ensure that there was good balance taking place, because in the past there wasn't, uh, and many of the rules and conditions that are in the code are there to, to make sure that that is a protection. But as we already have heard today, uh, we could find ourselves in a very difficult situation uh, and councillors could find themselves in some very difficult situations in the interpretation uh, of this code uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, can I ask who actually was consulted? You've indicated that because the leaders made a, a, a comment. Did, what, did they give written evidence? Did they take uh, 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 sightings from any of their own councils? Uh, is there any evidence to suggest that when we were looking at bullying and harassment, what areas were looked at with reference to bullying and harassment, or was it just a, 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 a overview? Uh, uh, you've touched on the ministerial code. Uh, uh, I would suggest that the ministerial code may well cover what a minister looks at, but that may not be the same for a councillor. And you and I, myself have had these rules for a number of years prior to coming into this place. Uh, it's a very different environment uh, in a council chamber. It's a very different environment in a council itself uh, as to what a councillor's role and responsibilities are involved in the community, who he or she gets involved with, uh, uh, the complexities that they may, may face. Uh, are very different uh, uh, to the roles that we have here. So, as I say, I'd like to find out more about the consultation, who was involved, what was discussed, and what areas uh, of expertise were taken in bo on board when making this decision. OK. Um, I'll, I'll take in Brian uh, Petty in a moment, uh, convener. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, uh, bullying and harassment, I don't think it matters if you're a minister or an MSP or a councillor um, or, or whatever public servant you are, um, there should not be any bullying uh, or harassment going on. Um, the wording, um, uh, as I said, has been chosen uh, to match that in the uh, ministerial code. Uh, we have, and has been agreed not only with COSLA, uh, but with the Standards Commission and the Commission for Ethical Standards. Um, and my understanding is, and Brian will give you the detail, um, that it was passed by COSLA leaders. I do not know um, if there was any dissent to that. I don't think there was, uh, but I'll, I'll pass you over to Mr. Petty in that regard. Uh, yes, just to, just to add that, yes, it, um, the proposed change was endorsed by COSLA leaders at a meeting at the end of March. Uh, I can't speak to what consultation may have taken place between COSLA and their member councils, before that, but we did have quite lengthy discussion with COSLA officials before that meeting to lay out the proposed wording of the change to the code um, and discuss that with them. Uh, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, um, we did also discuss it uh, at official level with the Standards Commission and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. Um, in fact, I may say originally the proposed uh, wording on this uh, was going to be a bit uh, longer, but the Commission and the Commissioner felt that it was actually potentially unhelpful to do so, partly because of the risk of accidentally excluding behaviours that actually ought to be included, and that the better approach was actually to have a very clear and short amendment, and that's the approach that we adopted. Okay. So, Convener, I, I, I mean, all 32 leaders of councils had a say, or should have had a say in this, at their leaders' meeting, and they would have seen um, uh, the proposals uh, that were put before that leaders' meeting. Okay. Um, I want to leave a couple of questions I've got until the end. Are there any other questions from, from members? Uh, Jenny Gorris. Um, the substantive changes, as we've mentioned there, make this addition in Section 3 to, to making clear that bullying and harassment is completely unacceptable. So I'd really like to look at it from a gender perspective because we've heard recent reports um, with regard to, to bullying and harassment at local level. And in Fife, um, a Conservative councillor, actually, Linda Holt, has spoken out previously about misogynistic bullying leading to women being shamed into silence. Um, and the gender representation on our councils isn't great. We know nationally we've only got six council leaders that are female. So there's arguably still a match culture which exists at council level um, and Alexander Stewart's absolutely right there is a different culture within our councils I've witnessed five council meetings in the past and I've got to say I was pretty shocked by some of the culture um, that happened in terms of the meetings and with regard to behaviour of elected members so um, I'd just like to ask you then Minister do you recognise there's a difference in terms of cultures and do you think the code needs further formalised specifically with regard to gender and I'm also thinking with regard to what's happened more recently in terms of sexual harassment um, convener, the reason why the words uh, bullying and harassment uh, were used and uh, no, no specifics yeah. um, is, quite frankly, you could go into a huge amount of specifics, whether yeah. that be gender, mm -hmm. um, homophobic, um, race, yeah. and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's much easier uh, to say that we have zero tolerance for any sort yeah. of bullying and harassment. Um, it may well be that we have to make amendments um, to this after the Standards Committee report, um, but as uh, Ms Gilruth has mentioned, um, there have been people like Councillor Holton um, and others across the country, um, a number of whom who are new to go local government, who have been quite shocked yeah. um, at the behaviours uh, that there have been. Beyond that, um, the change in demographic um, in local authorities at the last election allowed other folks who felt uncomfortable previously um, but were unwilling to say anything about it uh, to come forward. Yeah. And I think that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I want to see is a situation uh, whereby uh, we are very clear um, that we will not tolerate bullying, and harassment in any shape or form. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'd also like to ask a question with regard to social media, because there's not, I think, an explicit reference um, in the code to online behaviours, but within the general conduct section, um, th there is reference to it. So councillors, for example, are encouraged to think about whether your comments are likely to bring your office into disrepute, whether you're treating others with respect, Tone can be harder to convey online, so consider whether humour, irony and sarcasm can be perceived as such. There's even a reference to, to retweets or to likes, which perhaps can be done in, a, I suppose, a passive-aggressive manner or in a surreptitious way. Um, there is a possibility, though, that councillors will ignore the guidance willfully, as it's obviously not stipulated within the code, as far as I understand it. Do you think this needs to be revisited? Uh, I'll bring Brian in first, please, convener. Um, I'll let Brian deal with this aspect Certainly. first. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit sorry the Minister described me as the expert. That sometimes can be an invitation to disaster, <laughs> yes. but um, I'll take my chances. Um, one of the proposed amendments to the Code does in fact refer to social media, and that was at the suggestion of the Standards Commission. Um, if you look at paragraph 3.1 mm -hmm. of the amended Code, mm -hmm. um, it explicitly uh, requires councillors to respect the rules of, go of good conduct, including when using social media. <laughs> and that's an area where the, the Commission uh, felt that while that was uh, probably implicitly included, it would be 
sensible and appropriate to include a specific reference to it, and that's why it's been added. Again, that might be something that could be come back to in a wider review of the code as to whether that yeah. ought to be expanded upon, uh -huh. but at least for now, we will now have an explicit reference to social media in the amended code yeah. if it's approved. Okay. I hope Thank that's you. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Whiteman, did you want to come in? Th thank you, Vera. Um, just a general question. In um, Section 5 of the Code on Declaration of Interests, um, councillors are required to declare any financial or non-financial interest of a spouse, a civil partner, cohabitee, a close relative, a close friend, a close associate, an employer, a partner in a firm. It goes on. None of these requirements apply to MSPs. Now, we're not approving an MSP code here, but I'm just wondering, in general terms, why... Um, it's, it, it's felt um, that that degree of financial interest of councillors and people that they know continues to be required in the code, specifically when, with the, um, uh, the interests of um, members of the Scottish Parliament Act, we don't have to say anything about our spouses, cohabitees, partners, close relatives, etc. Uh, I'm not responsible, of course, uh, convener, no, no, no. Uh, for um, MSPs uh, and the declarations uh, that they have to make. Um, I uh, was, uh, I have to say, quite used to all of this um, as a local authority member, uh, and personally, I would have no problem in uh, declaring all of this as uh, an MSP, but I'm here to talk uh, today about the councillor's <coughs> code of conduct. No, no, but that, that's why I'm asking. What, uh, what, what is the continuing justification of this degree of declaration but, uh, to be made by councillors? Obviously, um, this code has been in place for a long while, um, put together after a huge amount of consultation, including consultation uh, with the public. Um, and this uh, is what we have. Um, this is the councillor's code of conduct. Uh, if members want to talk about any other codes of conduct, uh, I think they need to do that with the other uh, relevant uh, ministers in that regard. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the general public um, itself, um, there is an expectation that folks should be uh, as tra transparent as they possibly can be, and I think that that's what this does. Okay. Now, any, any further questions, Mr. Whiteman? I will let Mr. Gibson back in a second, but I'm going to ask a couple oh, of questions no, first. Or oh, I thought you were going to back in. Uh, it'll take Mr. Simpson a second then. So, can, can I ask then, in relation to bullying harassment, under the the code as it stands before it gets changed? If an accusation of bullying or harassment was made against a councillor, how would it be dealt with in the current code? There, there's a general line. What, what was the previous line? Uh, yeah, the, we'll get you the previous line first. Uh, well, the, the general provision in the code as it stands is a requirement to, re to retreat other persons with respect. Yeah. And it's fair to say that that has been used in the past uh, as the basis for proceedings under the code against councillors for behaviour that could be described as bullying or harassment. Uh, so it's quite it's a very wide ranging but very general statement that's already in the code. Right, I th I think that 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 becomes it's significant. There's there's obviously a thirst amongst committee members here for the code to be looked at more more generally. I would be loathed not to pass something today that 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 didn't be much more clear about bullying harassment. Quite frankly, but I think there might need to be some reassurance about where we move forward after today. So what I would ask about is what your intentions, a bit more clarity, Minister, in relation to what your intentions might be once the Standards Committee concludes its evidence, irrespective of what's in that, um, would you return to this committee and look to see what the opportunities could be collegiately with this committee and looking again more generally at the code? As I said, Convener, um, we'll look and see what the Standards uh, Committee has to say about um, the entire scenario. Um, I'm uh, not averse to coming back here and discussing further um, the Code of Conduct. It may well be that the Standards Committee report itself will uh, quite clearly show that there's a, a need for a review. It may not. As I said in my opening remarks, uh, this has not really been looked at uh, in any great depth in terms of uh, change since 2010. Um, it's uh, probably about time that we actually took uh, an overview to see if a review is required. Yeah, and that's without prejudice to what the Standards Committee does or doesn't report. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, Mr Simpson? 
Yeah, um, I, I want to ask specifically about Section 7, but uh, just reflecting on what we've heard already, um, and w the, the committee's only really just started looking at this, and me uh, all members have raised a number of very interesting points. You've accepted, you may need to reflect further. Why don't we, why don't we just park this for, for now, and you know, the, just let, let, let the committee do its job. We can make suggestions. Uh, convener, you now? convener, I'm quite happy for the committee to do its job, uh, but I also have uh, a job to do. Um, and I would be failing, I think, in my duty um, to disregard um, the uh, situations uh, that I have heard about in recent times, uh, which I have to say, uh, from my perspective, many of them are truly and utterly shocking. Um, and I think that we have got to do our level best uh, to eradicate bullying and harassment in whatever shape or form, uh, in our not only in our local authorities, but also elsewhere. Uh, the First Minister showed leadership in this by changing the ministerial code uh, very quickly indeed. Uh, with the agreement of COSLA and the president of COSLA, Alison Everson, and leaders, uh, we uh, want to do likewise, and I think we should be doing so now and not waiting, not waiting uh, for anything else, uh, but to show that we have got a clear commitment uh, that uh, these behaviours are unacceptable. Okay, I, I think quite naturally, any other points, and I'm looking at members who wish to make, they could meet in the next agenda item, which is a, a, to debate the, the motion before us anyway. So if there's no other specific questions, I would intend moving on to the next agenda item. Don't see anyone indicating a specific question. So uh, that being the case, uh, can we now move to agenda item four, which is still on code of conduct for councillors? And for this item, the committee will formally consider motion S five M one two one nine one, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the revised and updated code of conduct for councillors for the ethical standards and public life, etc. Scotland Act. 2000. Only the Minister or members may speak during this debate. And can I therefore uh, invite the Minister to speak to and move motion S5M12191. I think I've said all I need to say uh, on the subject, Convener, uh, and I move the motion in my name. Okay, thank you. Can I invite members if they wish to make a contribution within the debate? Mr Simpson. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, unfortunately, uh, today we're not only looking at the uh, revises to the code, we're looking at the entire code, um, and this was what we'll be voting on. Uh, indeed, when we had uh, Bill Thompson before us at this committee, um, I asked him if that's what we should be doing at this point, looking at the whole code, and he, he said, uh, yes, in an ideal world, that's what you should be doing. That, In fact, that is what we're doing. So we need to take not just the uh, proposals for change, uh, but what's there already. Um, I was going to go on to ask, I can't ask, so I just need to make points on Section 7, um, which is pro probably my biggest bugbear about the Code, uh, is it limits the ability of councillors to express a view on planning matters. Um, in fact, uh, one, one part of the Code, Section 7.3, uh, actually says, you must not prejudge. Not just, you must not say what you think. You must not prejudge. And that, uh, that, now, that strikes me as, you must not even have thoughts about planning applications. Not that you can't say what you think about them um, in advance. Uh, so that seems to me to be... Um, you know, it's just, uh, li it, it, it limits free speech. I always felt this when I was a councillor. I was a councillor for uh, 10 years. Um, I thought it was absolutely absurd that when, once you're elected uh, as a councillor, you're elected to represent people. You're elected to take opinions on things. And why shouldn't you be able to express an opinion in advance of a com committee meeting, accepting that when you've heard um, further evidence, you may well come to a different view, but you certainly should be able to say what you think. The code um, prevents councillors, and quite uh, actually, they often hide behind this, so they, um, they actually don't they don't get involved in in planning matters be, because of this. Um, so you're not entitled to express an opinion once 
uh, a planning application is live. Although, bizarrely, you are entitled to express opinion before it goes live. So you can say what you think before it goes live, but once it's live, you, you, are, you are effectively stymied. I, I think that is absurd, uh, and for that reason, and indeed the, uh, the, some of the woolly language that we've heard earlier, um, I would be moving against it. Any other contributions at this point? Um, Mr Gibson? Yeah, my concern uh, first and foremost is that the committee has been effectively bounced into this. Uh, I think there should have been much more consultation with the committee and deliberations and discussions and taking evidence on this. I was actually involved in the first ever uh, code, if you like, way, way back in the 1990s when I was a Glasgow City Council when, he set, when we, when we uh, brought in a, a, a kind of um, a code there, the first in Scotland, and I remember weeks and weeks of evidence taken, deliberations, etc., to do that code. And of course, things have been built on since then, but it seems to be growing arms and legs. Uh, the situation in planning, I was a councillor, of course, in the days when we didn't have this nonsensical restriction. The public, point blank, do not understand it, do not comprehend why the people they've elected can't actually have a say in terms of planning uh, decisions uh, which they are lobbying them on. Uh, so there's an element of frustration in there. In terms of the issue we talked about with regard to, to, to uh, bullying, I do think that there has to be much more detail on that. Um, uh, which other members have commented on in terms of, you know, it's, you know, online sarcasm, you know, it's someone speaking quietly and menacingly bullying, but someone shouting not bullying or vice versa, for example. I mean, how do we actually decide on these matters? I think there has to be much more discussion on that. And, and because the leaders dis discussed it, I, I imagine, I don't know if all 32 were in attendance, what the vote was or where they consulted their own members, but certainly I think in terms of the code to go forward, we, sh we should uh, look at this much more comprehensively. And I think if we do that, we'll have something which is much more workable and which uh, the public and, and elected members themselves understand and are much more willing and able to work with. Other contributions? <coughs> um, Mr Whiteman. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, the, obviously ministers, it's the duty of ministers to bring forward this code and, and, and get Parliament's approval for it. I think from the questions that were asked earlier and from some of the contributions of my colleagues, uh, it's clear that there still remain uh, questions as to the appropriateness of some of the elements in this code. Um, I, I'm particularly uncomfortable uh, as an MSP um, voting on a code which requires councillors to divulge financial and non-financial interests relating to family members, um, which increasingly uh, um, intrudes on their privacy. Um, understand why that's all there. I'm just saying that the contrast between uh, the duties placed on an MSP <clears throat> and those on a councillor are very, very profound. And I would like to explore whether that's an ongoing, whether that's appropriate uh, or, or, or in it, uh, going, going forward. I have some sympathy with Graeme Simpson's comments on Section 7, um, uh, some substantial sympathy. Um, it seems to me that a lot of this code has evolved since um, uh, the first one was issued on the basis of very specific concerns relating to possibly very specific uh, instances. Um, and it's quite understandable that a code should respond to, in general terms, um, matters that arise, for example, the emergence of social uh, media. But I'm a little bit concerned that some of these restrictions I mean, haven't been subject to full consideration as to their ongoing applicability. And given, I mean, this is only a code, but it's a code that can ultimately result in councillors um, undergoing severe sanctions. Uh, I, am, I very much welcome the incorporation of the bullying and harassment element of the code. Uh, this is one of the key uh, changes, the one of three substantive, one of two substantive changes to the code. And my own view is that um, Given the public um, concern around this, given some of the behaviours the minister himself uh, has alluded to, it would be wrong at this stage to vote against a code that is incorporating that new uh, provision. I think that would send a very wrong signal uh, to the public at large um, who are uh, expect the highest standards of behaviour from all elected members. So I'll be voting in favour of this code but, or in favour of recommending to Parliament, approves this code, but 
I think there are some substantive concerns. Graham Simpson's raised one, I've raised another, with regard to disclosure of financial and non-financial interests, that actually it is time to have a root and branch review of whether those are still appropriate, and if they are, in what terms they should be expressed in a code. Okay. Any other contributions? Um, okay, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. As someone who served for 18 years as a councillor, and we had a standard uh, in my own council before the code was introduced, uh, I, I acknowledge the fact a code was required, and I still believe a code is required. Uh, and adding things like bullying and, and harassment into the code is right. There's no question about that. But it has to be more explicit. We, in the past, we used respect. If anyone did not show respect in bullying and harassment, that was how they were managed. People who did bully and harass were dealt with in the code in the past. That was the case. The code has been no question individuals use the code to hide behind the code so they don't have to uh, give information to constituents, organisations or individuals. Uh, I certainly wasn't one who did that, but I was a witness of seeing that happen on numerous occasions uh, by individuals who felt that the code was uh, an advantage to them, uh, not to get embroiled in a situation. Uh, and that is their own choice. Uh, I, I have some sympathy for what's happening here today. I have some acknowledgement what the government is trying to do, but I still have some concerns about where we are uh, because we're not seeing the full picture. We're not being given every opportunity to have a discussion. We're only seeing this today. Uh, and as I say, we're having this discussion today. Uh, the committee have not had an opportunity to broaden that horizon, to broaden that process. Uh, so I have some real difficulty, uh, convener, uh, in, in seeing where we go. I want this code to be as robust as it should be to protect individuals and to ensure that people can have trust and confidence in the code. Uh, but as I say, if it's not explicit, then things can be left uh, in, a, in, a, in a worse situation uh, uh, than, than we have. Uh, and, and as I say, these are the concerns I have with it. Any other contributions? I'm trying to kind of wait. I'll make a contribution in a second, but Jenny, you're welcome to go after myself if, if you wish. Or Very briefly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I just, I, I suppose I'll go back to, to my question, um, then, Minister, which was with regard to gender. Um, I'm the only female MSP here today. Um, I'll be voting for it because I think it's really important that the behaviour that Alexander Stewart has just talked about that has not gone, I think, unchallenged in the past is not acceptable and we'll be sending a clear message by passing it today. And just looking around the table today, there are 14 men here and two women. I don't think that's okay in here and it shouldn't be okay out there either. Thank you. Um, it's an opportunity to, to, to see my views in relation to this. The reason I asked a, a specific question about what, what's in the, the previous code uh, in relation to treating others with respect, uh, that is clearly a vehicle by which someone who believes them subject to bullying harassment can use, and I'm sure it has been used effectively mm -hmm. in the past. But the fact that we don't actually say anywhere within the code bullying and harassment is wrong and people should come forward is a flaw in the code, and it should be changed. And I will be supporting that change here today. I think the message we've been sent out by not supporting this today would be an appalling one, yeah. is, 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 is my view. Um, However, there is a general thirst for the code to be looked at in the round. I don't think these are competing interests. Mm. So in relation to concerns in relation to financial declarations, that's a, kind of a continuing issue that some members of the committee will have. That's not a change mm. that's been made today. Um, and there's a variety of other things that, that members have said, which is not a change that we're looking at today. The most fundamental aspect of the changes we're looking at today, whatever we cut it, is whether or not we send out a clear message that bullying and harassment is wrong and we wish people to come forward. I absolutely get the points that um, what, what, what do we mean by bullying and harassment? I suspect if you feel like you know what it is and once you get down to too much clarity and definition, you start to exclude some people who feel they've been bullied and harassed. So I think there are huge challenges there because context and... Uh, objectivity or subjectivity are not always there when people feel they've been bullied and harassed, but not to have it included in a code of conduct is, is an omission. Um, I would seek in the, the Minister summing up uh, a reassurance that we will look at this again after the Standards Committee reports, 
I should point out that I'm not using it as leverage. I will support this today because it includes a clear assertion that bullying harassment is not acceptable or be acted upon. But that doesn't negate all the significant issues more generally with the code that other members have raised. So I st we'll still be seeking that assurance that we'll be here again, we'll look at this again, and we'll work out collegiately, not just how six or seven MSPs at this committee mm -hmm. looks at a councillor's code of conduct or how 32 council leaders might look at a councillor's code of conduct, but more collegiately with individual councillors on the ground that have to do that job, eh, women as well as men, eh, and have that kind of co-production of whatever a revised code should mean and hopefully we'll be back there looking at that, but I can't possibly vote against something that says bullying and harassment is wrong in local authorities across the country where it happens, and we should be encouraging people to step forward and make complaints. Uh, so that's my bit in relation to this anyway, Minister. Uh, are there any other contributions from committee members, uh, Mr Simpson? Just for clarity, because um, uh, you, you, yourself and uh, Jenny Gilruth in particular have spoken passionately about the uh, bullying and harassment section. My concern is not uh, that we shouldn't say something about bullying and harassment, but we just need to be clearer what it is. My my fear um, is that if this goes through, uh, and today today we're not putting it through, we're just sending it on to on to Parliament, is that you know it, I, I do think it will it could open the the floodgates. So genuine cases of bullying and harassment. Um, which do need to be dealt with could get lost. Can I also, can I also say to members that I actually think that's a really helpful contribution. Because I disagree with Mr Simpson. I think it's a really important contribution to say that if we approve this today, it then goes to the full chamber for a final decision. And that's absolutely right. That's why it's an affirmative instrument. And that's another reason I think that we should be, we should be supporting it today. I also wouldn't doubt the integrity of other individuals that take a different view from myself in relation to tackling bullying and harassment. I just don't think it's a binary choice between reviewing the code more generally and looking at that as part of that review and passing this just now, which is why I'll certainly be, 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 be looking to, to support this just now. With the permission of members, I'll give the Minister the opportunity to sum up at this point, unless there's any other contributions. Thank you, Sir. Convener. Um, can I say, um, first of all, um, the, the reason why um, this revised code is in front of you with these two things um, is because, first of all, I feel that we must tackle the bullying and harassment issue, um, and we would be failing if we did not do so. But the other um, part of the re revision um, is round about um, that request from regional transport partnerships. Uh, and the reason why that is the only other revision is because that's the only other thing that we have been asked to look at um, in uh, a very, very long time. And I, I don't want to put on record that we've had nothing uh, about any of this um, in recent times, but there, uh, there has been no requests for any other re revision in recent times, whether that be on Section 5 or on Section 7 or any other um, part uh, of this uh, code. Um, convener, um, as I said uh, previously, um, I'm willing to um, look at this again after the Standards Commission has reported. Um, and I'm glad that the, um, the committee has taken a, a, a general interest in, in the round on this. Um, but, you know, um, we, um, as a government, look very carefully at requests that are made. We have had no other requests about revising this code in recent times, apart from that RTP's one, uh, which I agreed we would look at favourably. But we will look at, at the code uh, in the round. Um, if I could finish, um, Convener, uh, I remember when the Code of Conduct came into being, um, folk were say, said at that point in time, you know, that it would open up the floodgates uh, for lots and lots of complaints. And there were complaints. Um, but there were complaints um, which I think uh, that largely would have gone uh, un uh, undealt with before. There were some vexatious ones. There always is. We work in a political environment. Uh, that is the way of the world. Um, uh, so I don't think that this 
will open up the floodgates either. But what this has done, and what this discussion in recent times has done, um, is allowed people uh, the opportunity uh, to tell uh, folks that they are unhappy about certain aspects of the environments that they are working in. Uh, we should make that as easy uh, for them as possible. Uh, and that is why um, I feel uh, that it was right uh, to move uh, with this change on bullying and harassment uh, as soon as we could. Uh, we have uh, the agreement of COSLA on this. Um, if they were unhappy with it, I'm quite sure uh, that they would have let the committee know. Uh, and I would urge the committee uh, to back this motion today. OK, thank you, Minister. I think we've had a pretty vigorous uh, and open debate in relation to this, uh, but we do now move to the vote. So the question is that motion S5M12191 in the name of the Minister for Local Government and Housing be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. OK, we are not all agreed, and we then move to a division. Um, just go through the term. Can I ask those that agree with the motion to raise their hands, please? Thank you. Can I ask those who disagree with the motion to raise their hands, please? OK, thank you. Uh, can I ask if there's any abstentions? OK. OK. So the vote being three, four, two against, and one abstention. So that means that the motion before us is agreed to. And the committee will report on the outcome of this instrument shortly to Parliament. Uh, I thank you, Minister and your official, for taking the table with us today. Thank you. And we now move to Agenda Item 5, which is Public Petition PE1655. The Committee will consider Petition PE1655 in the name of Christine Metcalf on behalf of the Avich and Kilcrenan Community Council, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the process for designation of National Scenic Areas NSAs and consider increasing the number of NSAs in Scotland to protect the natural landscape and support the tourism sector. Prior referring the petition to our committee on the 26th of March, the Public Petitions Committee received oral and further written evidence from the petitioner, as well as written evidence from the Scottish Government and Scottish National Heritage. It recognised that given our committee had consulted its evidence, uh, had concluded rather its evidence taking on the planning bill, there would be limited scope for the issue to be considered during its stage one scrutiny of the bill. In fact, there won't be any opportunity for it to, to, to be um, discussed during stage one scrutiny. I suppose out with the, the actual stage one debate itself, perhaps. Um, so that being the case, uh, I would point out that there's nothing to preclude uh, individual MSPs from raising amendments if they so chose to uh, at stage two uh, of the planning bill's progress through Parliament should it, of course, reach stage two. So can I invite comments from members and agree what action, if any, they wish to take in relation to this petition and I'll outline two potential options that we could consider. Not precluding others, of course. Un first option is undertaking further work on the petition and if so, consider what further work would be undertaken or alternatively, noting and closing the petition, recognising that its stage one report has already been agreed to and that any MSP could bring forward amendments at stage two. Mr Gibson. Yes, and if you actually read what the petition says, I don't think it's really what they are intending in the petition. It seems to me in the detail of a petition that, in actual fact, the whole point of this petition is really to restrict and uh, reduce the, the number of applications going forward with regard to wind turbines. And I think if that was indeed the original intent, that should have been much more explicit in terms of the what the petitioner actually put in the petition itself um, and I would therefore take the view um, you know that um, we should not enclose the petition. Thank you. Any other views, Mr Whiteman? Uh, thanks, Convener. Yeah, the Section 50 of the 2006 Act lays out the provisions for designation of national scenic areas. It's the power for Scottish ministers to designate uh, one and uh, subsection four um, lays out the matters that Scottish ministers are, take, are to take account of um, in, in, in making such designations. The petition urges the um, calls on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the process of designation. Uh, but petition 
uh, doesn't suggest um, you know what the scope of that review might be or 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 in particular what elements that currently have to be taken account of in designating NSAs um, should be uh, looked at um, again uh, as uh, Mr Gibson says it appears that some of the motivation for this is to provide a stronger statutory framework within which to inhibit uh, the development of um, wind turbines. The letter from Scottish uh, Government makes it very clear that they're not minded um, to themselves review the process. Uh, they don't see the need to review the process. Um, I don't have sufficient evidence to suggest that the process um, as, as, as laid out needs to be uh, revised. Um, although, as Convener make quite clear, um, these are planning provisions. Stage two of the planning bill is coming up. It's open to any MSP to table amendments if they wish to change the process or any of the provisions in section 50 of the 2006 Act. And I would encourage the petitioners to get in touch with MSPs um, to discuss how that might be done. And in due course, if anything is tabled, Parliament and this committee will take a view. So uh, I don't think there's much further we can do um, and would um, suggest we note and close the petition, um, uh, recognising that the planning bill is going through Parliament. This is a planning provision and there's now scope over the next eight months or so uh, to make amendments in this field if anyone feels it's appropriate. It's also worth noting um, for the petitioner that it's not just MSPs who are members of this committee that can submit amendments uh, at stage two. It's open to, to all, all MSPs uh, to, 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 to do so. Are there any other comments? The, the, the mood from the two comments we've heard and the nodding heads would suggest that, that we take the second approach here, which is we note and close the petition and make the petitioner aware of opportunities potentially at stage two or stage three in relation to amendments, so would that be agreed? Okay. Uh, can I thank everyone for that? That concludes Agenda Item 5. And when I move to Agenda Item 6, which we previously agreed will conduct in private. So I move into private session. <laughs>